next uh, department is the fire department. Commissioner Sawyer, whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, sir. Sorry for the delay. Okay. Good afternoon, Good Councilman afternoon. Greeley and members of City Council. I'm Fire Commissioner Derek Sawyer. Joining me today will be Deputy Commissioner of Operations Jesse Wilson to my right and Deputy Commissioner of EMS Jeremiah Laster to my left. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to appear before you this morning to give testimony on the Philadelphia Fire Department's operating budget. I would also like to thank you on behalf of the 2,400 firefighters, paramedics, emergency medical technicians, and support staff for the crucial role that council plays in providing funding for public safety of our citizens. For the routine calls from assistance to dramatic national news incidents like Amtrak 188, this fire department is proud to serve the citizens and visitors of our great city. The recommendations of this department for additions to our operating budget will make us both safer and more efficient in a more efficient fire department. I will discuss a few of these significant additions and be available to you at the end of my testimony to answer any questions you may have. The first budget item I will discuss is a significant increase in our ability to provide inspections of buildings to mitigate the dangers of fire and other hazards. This is a difficult, this is a direct result of lessons learned from the 2013 building collapse at 22nd and Market Street. Council took action based on the 2015 report of the Building Oversight Board to fund increased staffing in the fire department's fire code unit over the 2016 to 2018 physical years and to provide training to certify every captain and lieutenant to Fire Inspector 1. This, expect, this expanded code unit will work in teams with other vital partners at license and inspections and will be stationed in the neighborhoods to ensure the safety of our citizens. The training provided to every single line officer will give every fire company the knowledge to sp spot and report hazards throughout the city. The second operating budget item is the addition of self-contained breathing apparatus, what we call SCBA fit testing, to ensure masks fit properly and do not leak air while operating in hazardous conditions. The National Fire Protection Association recommends annual SCBA fit testing. Fire department analysis indicates that the contracting of this service is cost effective as a cost effective means of enhancing the safety of personnel. A funding increase in medical supplies was requested due to both the increased volume of EMS responses and the increasing cost of pharmaceuticals. Medic units must be stocked with the proper equipment and supplies to meet the ever increasing demand for medical services. Department expenditures on pharmaceuticals on average has increased 58% over the last two years. The cost increase for medical supplies on average was 9% between fiscal year 14 and 15. This includes an increased cost for bandages, cervical collars, and gloves, all of which are especially critical to protect EMS providers and the public. This funding increase is necessary to prevent critical supply shortages and to meet the Pennsylvania Department of Health equipment and supply requirements for ambulances. These supplies are critical in keeping with the department's mission of delivering high quality emergency medical care. I am ready to now answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, let me just start. Uh, um, what were the number of related fire deaths in the last year? Do you have that? Last year? Yeah. Twelve. Twelve? Is that a decrease or increase? That or? is a 63% decrease from the prior year and a 50% decrease from our, uh, our all-time low, which was in 2013 of 24. So it's, it's going down. Correct. Uh, 
do you think there's any particular things you you uh, put that to or oh ab absolutely so it's a it's a combined effort so one of the things we've done is is install smoke alarms of course but it, yes. But in addition to installing smoke alarms, we've actually been doing home visits where you get a chance to educate the community about uh, fire hazards in the home and talk to them about how to be safe and how to maintain a, a high level of safety. Uh -huh. So we've done that in partnership with a couple of other organizations like the American Red Cross and the Insurance Society of Philadelphia. And that effort of public education along with installing smoke alarms have helped us reduce the number of alarms. Okay, that's great. I actually knew that. I just want to make sure you got that on record because you're doing a great job with that. And Thank you very much. I think much. that's certainly saved a lot of, lot of lives. As far as your average response time, and, um, how does that, what is it and how is that uh, compared to the national average? So response times as it relates to um, engines is, that, is it within the national average of five minutes. Our EMS response times are kind of high. And one of the things we're doing to address the response times for EMS is we've implemented an Office of Community Risk Reduction, and we're trying to identify the super users in our system. So a super user is an organization that calls us more than, what, 15, 20, more than 20 times a month. Mm -hmm. That's considered a super user. So we started a pilot program with Friends Hospital to try to figure out how we can reduce the super users by educating them and, and making sure that the person, if they didn't need emergent care, we can get other transportation. Because a lot of times the calls that we're receiving to the super user are low acuity, acuity calls. Right. So that's one of the things we've done. We've also implemented a priority dispatch system in our fire communications unit so that when we get to the point where we have a high number of calls, we can uh, stack calls that are, aren't emergent to make sure we address the more emergent calls. So you, so you get some people who might continuously call with just feeling a Correct. little ill or something right like so that. some people call and you get there right. and they have their bags packed and ready to go so obviously that's not an emergency so I one had of the a neighbor like that so I know yeah, right so so <laughs> one of the things we do is try to we're meeting with those people too so we try we we're, we're uh, attacking the facilities first like hospital like nursing homes or uh, friends hospital things like that to mm -hmm. address that's going to have a larger impact or like the the um, the places where people stay when they get out of prisons, those are one of the super users. And then we're going to attack the civilians also. So we had a young, uh, older adult that was calling us on a regular basis. And a lot of times she would call because she just needed for someone to help her get up because she had fallen. So we found out she was falling because she wasn't taking her meds. So we sent mm. someone to the house, talked about her taking her meds and offering her uh, assistance, connecting her with home health care to make sure she takes her meds, and then that reduces the number of calls to that house. Okay. All right. I appreciate it. And that kind of answers one of the council president's questions. It says that uh, requests, 911 requests for EMS are expected to increase by over 20,000 incidents by the end of this fiscal year. Yes, correct. And that's the kind of thing you're working on to try to... Okay. That's correct. Great, great. Um, when the police commissioner was in here today, he uh, talked about the uh, sort of problem of trying to get qualified uh, people to be police officers. Are you, ha what, are you having any problems in the fire department in that, in that area? No, no problem getting qualified people. One reason is when we hire firefighters, we don't require them to be qualified. What we do is we certify them mm -hmm. at the firefighter one and two level. They leave with the uh, EMT certification and they also leave with fire and life safety education certification. So we bring them in at the grassroots level and we certify them to all the levels they need to have. In reference to uh, paramedics and EMTs, they come onto the job already certified as either mm -hmm. a paramedic or EMT. And so far, we haven't had a problem of filling that pool. Okay. Yeah, I probably used the word qualified wrong. He, he was just having problems getting people to, right. to apply. You know? No, we but have a list waiting. Pardon me? We have a list waiting for uh, paramedics, a mm -hmm. paramedic list. A class is supposed to be starting, I believe, in June. And um, after that, we were, we're going to have a class for EMTs. We have two firefighter classes in currently now. Okay. We started out with 100 in each class. They, they graduate this year, this June. And right now, we have about 86 in one class and 95 in the other class. Okay, very good. One last question, and some of the council members now have teed up. Uh, page four of your written testimony shows your apartment has only attained a 3% 
MWD and DBE uh, participation so far in fiscal 16, though the goal was 15 percent. Is there a reason why we, we, you know, or you're struggling to, to get to that, that kind of number? Yes. So in the fire service, we deal with um, different types of supplies like self-contained breathing apparatus, uh, ladders for vendors for ladders, pump testing, and there aren't a lot of minority businesses that actually do ladder testing, pump testing, and things like that. So okay. that's what's making it difficult to meet so that goal. Not a lot of people, not a lot of those companies bid. Is what you're right. Okay. Exactly. All right. Thank you. All right, thank you. Go, uh, Councilman Dom. Thank you, uh, Councilman Greenlee. And good afternoon. I've a few questions. Yes, sir. Um, I'm looking at the budget, not the testimony, but the budget. I don't know if you have it handy or you know the numbers, but <clears throat> on page um, three of the budget, I'm just curious as to why personal services were the obligations in 2015 were $7.5 million. In 16, they were 4.8, but yet they're going to be 12 million in 17. I'm just wondering why that went up so much. So you're saying page three? Page three, section 47, the department summary by fund and class. I guess it would be uh, class 100A. It says personal services in the second paragraph down, basically. Oh, purchase of services. Personal services. Personal services. I don't see that. You can get me an answer. <clears throat> you don't have to figure it out now. All right. Give us the answer. And the other question I have is um, <clears throat> on page five of the budget, the overtime obligations in 2015 were $35 million. Say that again. The overtime it says shift uniform overtime $35 million based on total pay of $208 million. And then in 16, it went down to 24. Actually, it's going to be $29 million. It went down six. This year, we're projecting it to go down 10. I'm just wondering how we're going to accomplish that goal when it was 35 and 15 and 29 and 16. How are we going to get it to 19 and 17, which is great. I just want to make sure we accomplish that goal. So the plan to accomplish the goal is to, we, we have two fire classes in now. So once these two classes graduate, we should be fully staffed, which should be able to cut down on overtime. Another thing we're going to do is we're putting in, uh, performance measures in place for each battalion to track the overtime on a regular basis to make sure that they're meeting that standard. And not only for uh, members in the staff, I mean, and members in the field, but staff members also. So by tracking the overtime on a, on a weekly basis versus a monthly basis, I think we can identify areas in, a, in advance to make sure that we're not going over that projection. So in the numbers that I'm looking at, what you're saying is in 15, the overtime was roughly 17% of the total payroll of the, of the fire department, right. 17%. And in 16, it was roughly 14.5%. It was going down. And we're saying next year it's going to be 10%. That's the goal. Uh, are we going to be able to hit that goal? It would be great to hit it. I won't be here to let you know, but we're going to try. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman O. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I actually don't have any questions. I know that there's, you know, been so much stuff going on, but I didn't want to miss the opportunity to just say how much uh, it has been a pleasure to work with you, your accessibility. It's been fantastic. I really enjoyed our last meeting with Commissioner Ross and yourself, and uh, just a dynamic uh, couple of commissioners. I'm sorry to see you leave. I wish you would stay, but uh, I know that you have, you know, uh, good fortune uh, laying ahead of you and to your whole command team. So thank you for your great work. Thank you. It was a pleasure working with you also. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. I think that was well said. Thank you. Uh, Councilwoman Bass. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, ditto. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we, we've uh, had a great working relationship with uh, you and your administration, and I just wish you well into the future. And for all that you do, um, you know, if we can ever be of assistance, please reach out. It's, it's been really a pleasure to work Thank with you. Thank you very much. Um, I do have a couple of questions. And um, 
The first was in reference to the conditions of our firehouses. And so we've talked about this before. I've been to every firehouse in my district and police station. And, um, you know, I know the condition of these facilities and wanted to know what's been done, what kind of um, action plan has happened in the last couple of years since I've been asking these questions uh, for some time now to uh, address the really just deplorable conditions of our firehouses. And um, the folks who work there have been most gracious. And, uh, you know, when we go in and we do a tour and uh, we'll talk to them about uh, what's happening in the neighborhood, that's really the purpose of the tour is to talk about what's happening, what are they seeing throughout my district. But when I go in, I'm often, well, actually not even at this point, it's not uh, a matter of shock anymore, right. but uh, really a disappointment that we would allow city employees to work and to ask them to sleep in these conditions. So if you want to address that. Absolutely. Well, first we've been working with uh, public property to make sure that they address those issues. We've had um, major work done on, on multiple stations. We even have two stations that are closed down right now, but getting major repairs, Engine 72 and Engine 69. Do you know what's, where, where are those located? One is at, uh, in West Philly, and 72 is in Logan. And we're getting ready to open up 71s, which is in the northeast. Is Logan, is that? Um, 72, uh, 12th, and, 12th and Loudon. 12th and? 10th and Loudon. Loudon, okay. That's yes. Okay. So um, working with public property, they've been, been doing a pretty decent job of trying to keep up with the demands. Uh, we have old infrastructure, and uh, whenever emergencies sure. occur, sometimes they have to stop working on a major project to make sure they work on another project to get us back in service quickly. Um, mm -hmm. The public safety facilities has a master plan that we're working on also where they're going to, uh, it's already been projected out, the improvements over the next five years. Mm -hmm. So that's an ongoing process. I think public property probably can give you more detail on the plan on what's next to be repaired. Okay. We do, uh, actually, we do a uh, we have uh, windows, heating systems, and that's being done on a continuous basis also. Okay. And also, if you could address um, the uh, resources available to the EMTs that are located at those sites. Usually when I've gone to different firehouses throughout my district, the EMT uh, truck is almost always gone. Right. And they're always on the street. And so uh, just the... the, the um, wear and tear, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, on not only them as individuals, but also on their equipment. And, um, and all of this really translates into the service that we're able to provide for usually our neediest and most vulnerable populations. So right. can you address that? So when you say the resources, could you give me, be a little bit more specific as far as, what, as, far as the EMTs? Well, just, uh, it, it seems that they don't have enough of anything. And so I may be incorrect in that, but I'd like for you to expound on it in terms of, you know, are, are they fully stocked? Do they have all of the resources that they need? Maybe yes. you could answer that better than no I No problem, could. yes. So they are fully stocked. Um, we've actually added additional medic units, uh, five last year, right? Five, that fed, five medic units last year and five additional this year. Um, again, you saw an increase in medical supplies. That's to make sure that they have enough medical supplies to do okay. their job correctly. Okay. And in a, in a, to address the high call volume and stress you heard right. me talk about earlier, we're trying to come up with ways to address the super users to reduce the call volume so that they won't be, uh, have burnout, suffer from burnout. The call volume from the super users and then a little bit about public education. We're about to roll out an ad campaign Good. to educate the community about when you should call 911. Okay. And that should help reduce some of the call volume also. Because right now, um, three-fourths of the calls are, well, three-fourths of the medicines are new, but I think 80% of the calls are non, or low acuity calls. 80% are low acuity calls. So that means only low acuity, not non-emergencies. Non-emergencies. So 20% are emergencies. So mm -hmm. we can get the, the, the community to understand the importance of the what's not an emergency and have them stop calling for non-emergencies. We can address the 
emerging calls more effectively and reduce the call volume at the same time. I guess my question is if we know that 80 percent of non-emergencies, and I know I think it's a great thing to roll out a campaign to address that and to get people to understand, um, you know, don't call 911. Uh, you know, this is the appropriate way to handle such and such right. and such. But uh, how, how long do you think it's going to take for that campaign to be up and running so that people, uh, in the meantime, you know, our EMTs are, are still working That's correct. Qu quite a bit uh, in a very stressful environment. So, so how long do you think it'll be before we get to that point? So we, uh, in, in conversations with community marketing concepts now, the mm -hmm. plan is to roll it out in May. How long it takes to have an impact, that's a good question. Uh, the next meeting, I can ask them to do an uh, impact analysis to see how That'd long it would it take for that message to get out, and then when will we start seeing results. Okay. That would be great, because, again, I think that, the, uh, you, you know, if, if, if uh, an EMT is completely stressed out and going out on call after call after call, and at some point, you know, that's right. there are the, the, the consumer, our constituents, uh, are not getting the proper service, um, you know, all of the EMT that they could get. Right. Not that the EMT or the person is trying to give less, but it's just, you know, human nature. At some point, you begin to slow down. You're going to slow down. So if you could get back to us and give us some kind of idea as to when we could see, uh, you know, an impact. see some sort of an impact, that would be fantastic. Thank okay. you. Thank you. And the goal is to measure along the way also each the month. The goal is to measure each month what the impact is. So okay. once we roll out the campaign, we already have a baseline. So mm -hmm. each month we can say, well, has it decreased, mm -hmm. has it stabilized, or has it gone up? So we'll okay. track that on a monthly basis once the campaign is rolled out. Very good. Thank uh, you. You're welcome. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, Councilman Taubenberger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just, not, not a question at all, but uh, Commissioner, I want to thank you for your service. I am saddened by the fact that uh, I will not be able to work with you in this capacity at this time, uh, having been newly elected. Um, I just want to say that my time at the Northeast Philadelphia Chamber of Commerce and in the community, you were always there for us. You were very supportive of community needs and small business needs, and I want that uh, recognized by all of Philadelphia. So I, I thank you very, very, very much for your service. Thank, thank you. you very much. Just hold one second, Commissioner, please. Councilman Heenan. Good afternoon, Good afternoon. Commissioner, and uh, apologize for being a little late to the hearing. And if I'm re repetitive, please just not a problem. Please just say. And, and one, I want to uh, thank you for um, you know with the hopefully the direction of, of the mayor uh, ending the brownouts in the city of Philadelphia. And I think that was an important message that. Uh, was uh, an edict that, that has been changed, and I think it's really important. I know my constituents and a lot of other members' constituents were, were, were extremely concerned, and people fought real long and, and, and hard for, for you know, a period of time to, to let their opinions and their, and their voices be heard. So, so thank you for that. You know, it's, we appreciate that. Uh, the question, uh, I, and, and I, I didn't miss it here with, with the uh, EMTs versus paramedics. Um, I don't know if that has been the actual conversation yeah. or not. Uh, can you tell me uh, the policy of uh, not pairing up uh, paramedics that are going out on, on calls or, you know, just the new policy with paramedics and uh, their training versus EMTs and the uh, the amount of training that they get and going out on, on calls and uh, so if if you can explain a little bit of that I'd, I'd appreciate it sure so a paramedic has uh, additional training normally you have to become an EMT before you become a paramedic um, one of the major differences is that a paramedic is allowed to give intravenous fluids meds and things of that nature and in the, what you probably referred to is in the past, um, an advanced 
Life Support Unit, AC, ALS Unit, Advanced Life Support Unit, has been staffed with two paramedics. And a BLS, Basic Life Support, support Unit, has been staffed with two EMTs. Going forward, the plan is to staff all ALS units with a paramedic and EMT. Now, uh, as far as uh, national standards and certification, that's the norm across the country of having a EMT and the paramedic <coughs> staff together. So what that does for us, it allows us, one, to do a better job of responding to ALS calls. So because you have an EMT and a paramedic in a medic unit, when you respond to a call, regardless of whether that call is an ALS call or a BLS call, you have someone certified in both realms and they can handle that call. So in the past, what would happen is if you sent a, a BLS unit to an ALS call, you would have to send additional, an additional unit, ALS unit, to help address that call. So now you have two units out of service instead of one unit out of service. So it's just a matter of using your resources more effectively and efficiently. Do we have uh, enough paramedics and enough EMTs to fulfill the responsibilities of, of national standards? Absolutely. Uh, we just hired 200 EMTs, and we are about to hire another 36 paramedics in June. So, yes, we do. Could, could paramedics, could somebody be a, a paramedic go out on like a, a run as opposed to a separate, you know, and I, don't, I know it gets a little, I'm not familiar with, you know, a paramedic truck and, and or, um, you know, different types of apparatuses, you know, in, 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 the, uh, in, in the houses. So, I mean, could there be, could you train a paramedic, or, or not, I'm sorry, could you assign a paramedic to go out on the initial calls? Because doesn't, you know, when, when you get a 911 response, who, who goes out first? It depends on the resource level, resource. So it could be a first responder company or it could be a, a medic unit. So would, would it, wouldn't it be, and it's just, I, I, you know, just from conversations that I've had, would it, would it also help to have a paramedic uh, go out on the, on the first response call? Possibly. Like on, on the apparatus or something, Possibly. have them cross-trained? Possibly. So, uh, so cross-training, I think, because paramedics, uh, I, I think, were, you know, eventually becoming, I mean, I could imagine, you know, the stress that, that paramedics and EMTs have. You know, I mean, all they're doing is, I mean, Trust me, I worked in the save, medic unit. Saving people's lives. I worked or, in the medic unit for like 10 years, the busiest medic unit in the city. Medic 22B. Yeah, right. so, so I do understand the level, high levels of stress, not getting any sleep at night, 20 calls at night, no rest, no food. I lived it. So, so they're the uh, extremely high stress. Extremely high stress. The highest volume of calls. No uh, rest. With, 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 that, with that at that. Hungry. Only, right? so Sleepy. How do, how do, how do we, how do we, how do we help Wet. <laughs> Tired. I know. How do, how do we help them out uh, with, with, with some of their, their responses? I mean, can we alleviate, I mean, I mean, you have overtime, you have not enough staffing, you have reassignments, you know, changing, or, or, or aren't they changing the policies of, uh, of moving around and, and not, not necessarily, you know, how, you know you're, you're assigned to a, a house or a station that's your call, right? I mean, that's your, your territory. And when you respond to the paramedics today, and EMTs, they're going to be changing all over the place, right, and being reassigned? Well, if I recall directly, when I give the oath of office to a firefighter, paramedic, or EMT, they're sworn to serve every citizen in the city of Philadelphia. They're not sworn to say, I'm only going to work in the Northeast, or I'm only going to work in North Philly, so I'm only going to work in Westfully. They're actually swear that they're going to serve and protect all the citizens of the city, no, not no, just a, a no, no one separate sector. I think you know. I mean, that goes with. I mean, that's a part of of their responsibilities. Of of, of course, um, just like any other first responder. Right? Yeah, exactly. And, and, but I'm I'm talking about um, response times. I'm talking about uh, policies that that make sense 
for uh, not only the citizens, uh, but you know, for for the paramedic and or EMT, uh, is there is there an opportunity to you know revisit how we you know structure the paramedics and EMTs, or even consider having uh, paramedics go out on runs with uh, with, with with some of the other absolutely. In, in the I houses? think yeah, absolutely. I think we do that every single year, and I think we do it on a continuous basis. So we believe in continuous process improvement where we look at every opportunity to make every member's life a little bit easier. So um, yes, there are opportunities there to try to restructure. One of the things we've done already is try to increase the number of medic units that's on shift from 35 to 50 a day, 24 seven. So, yeah, every single day we're looking at ways to make the system better and improve the life, the quality of life for our members. All right, and, and when you say national standards, are they national? I mean, I understand national standards, but are they, are they with these national standards for the paramedics and, and EMTs um, be comparable to a city of, of uh, Philadelphia? Uh, yeah, I think if you go to L.A., they're bigger than us, right? They do it. If you go to Chicago... You do the research. Yeah, I, listen, I, absolutely. I don't know I'm, I'm asking you. Yeah, absolutely. But that, yes, absolutely. And the way, the, with the plan going forward, what it does, it provides a higher level of service for all the citizens because of the fact that, once again, you have a paramedic on every single call now. You talked about them having advanced training. Well, that advanced training is important to all of the citizens. So now we have the ability to provide that on every single call, not just on some of our calls. Mm -hmm. So in the past, we had how, how many ALS units? We had 36. And how many BLS units? And 14. So we had 36 ALS units, 14 BLS units. So 14 units would respond with a lower level of care because those people weren't paramedics. Now, every single medic unit will have a paramedic on it, which means they can receive the highest level of care possible. So you're actually increasing the level of service for the community. Great. Uh, on callbacks, I know we're running a little bit of, uh, behind schedule, as you can, uh, as you're well aware of. So thank you for your, your patience. Uh, when we do callbacks, I want to, you know, kind of focus in a little more on, you know, the uh, ALS and, and the BLS. And, gotcha. you know, the whole process and assignments and, and things like that, and also the training of our officers. Fire officers? Uh, fire officers. Great. All mm -hmm. right. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Commissioner, as uh, just join the chorus here, thank you very much for all your service to the city over the Thank you. And thank you all for what you do. Thank you. Have a good afternoon.